Vice Chair Hall. If you'd please stand. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for a beautiful day that you've made. We thank you for the beautiful poppies on the west side of town. Father, I pray that you would bless this evening, bless each commissioner and the business that's being discussed. And Lord, I notice that we're uh, discussing the drought in the valley. And Father, I pray for more rain. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Face the flag, hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now the roll call, please. Commissioners Diana Cook. Present. Ryan Christ. Present. Cassandra Harvey. Absent. Raj Molly. Present. Fabian Tarasiano. Here. Vice Chairman Randy Hall. Here. Chairman James Fos. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Public business from the floor. If um, an individual is un unable to stay for the entire meeting, uh, we offer two minutes at this time for anyone who would care to do address the Commission on agendized items. Do we have any early speakers? We do not have any cards at this time. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> any person who would like to address the Commission on any agendized item then is requested to fill out a speaker's card and you will be called on when the item is uh, before the commission and you will be given three minutes to address the commission. Uh, tonight we have a relatively short agenda. The first item is our consent calendar which is approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of March 17, 2014. May we have a motion please? Yeah, I'll make the motion that we uh Approve the minutes from the regular meeting of March 17, 2014. Thank you. Second that. Thank you. Any comments? Please vote. Vote six zero with uh, Commissioner Harvey absent. <clears throat> Tonight we have a presentation um, from Los Angeles County Water Works. The presenter, or the principal presenter is Greg Even, I believe. However, there may be more. It looks like there's more. Thank you. Appreciate it. And if you state your name for the record and introduce your uh, colleagues if you wouldn't mind okay thank you first of all thank you very much mr. chairman commissioners it's uh, quite an honor to be here and uh, to talk about the drought situation uh, my name is Craig David and I am as Greg mentioned I am the area engineer for LA County Water Works districts I manage the local office here in Lancaster um, I'm also a resident of Antelope Valley and um, have about a hundred staff that work uh, in the office, uh, anything from engineering to fixing leaks to um, you know, pumping operations to billing. You know, probably many of you are our customers, so we hope we're giving you good service in all these areas. Um, as far as my uh, esteemed colleagues here, as you, Greg Even was the gentleman that you just spoke uh, with. He is uh, head of our uh, new water development and water resources section. And we also have Daniel Lafferty, who is also who is our principal engineer for Waterworks, and uh, they'll be happy, along with myself, to answer any questions you may have concerning the drought. Thank so, you. Th thankfully, you've got this up. Um, as many of you know, we're in a drought, and have been in a drought this year. Can't get my clicker to work. Try the other way. Not getting the clicker to work. But anyway. Um, We've been in a, actually a three years worth of drought. Uh, 2012 was below average. 2013 was one of the driest years on record. Is it not on? 
and then also this year. Oh, it's not working. Let's see if we can get that going. Hang with us for a second. We'll see if we can get it. Technical difficulties. Well, if need be, I can. I'll grab my uh, presentation. We can walk walk you along with it. Sorry. Right. Maybe our staff can figure it out for you. I'm sure you can if you want to okay. wait just a moment. Okay. There right, you go. The first slide you see here is a recent edition of the U.S. Drought Monitor. Basically, the darker the red color, the more the, the severeness of the drought until you get to the maroon or brown, whatever it is on your sheet there. And you can see California kind of plays a spotlight for the West. And it's not just that it's been this year. It's been several years' worth of drought that's made it very difficult for us. Next slide, if you would. This one is, shows the, the, the rainfall and precipitation throughout the state. And we get most of our rainfall, most of our precipitation uh, from the mountains. They ended up, it ends up going to the aqueduct and gets pumped down here for our use. And you can see the rainfall, if you can see the wettest year is the green line, 82, 83, very wet, about 88.5 um, inches, all the way to the driest at the bottom, 1976, 77. The blue line that's kind of squiggling up through the middle there is this current year. As you can see, we actually made the record for a brief pre uh, period this year. We were the lowest for up until we got that last big rain. But even now, with 26.7 inches, it's not real comfortable. You know, the average is the area shaded in blue, and you can see that we're still quite a bit below that. And you combine that with the last several years of rainfall, or lack thereof, and it's turning out to be a little bit difficult for us. Next slide, if you would. And this shows a snow survey summary that of all the, um, a lot of these areas are contributory to the aqueduct which we get our water from. And you can see it's only at 25%, so which is not very much. And this is a graphic illustration when you look at Folsom Lake, Folsom Dam. Uh, last year before we had below average rainfall, that was in 2011. You can see how full the lake was there. And this, this year on January uh, of 2014, you can see quite a dramatic, dif dramatic difference. One of the things someone pointed out to me is even the green uh, areas uh, in 2011 aren't green anymore, you know, and this is right in the middle of winter. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that we, as Waterworks District, get about two-thirds of our water from the, from the uh, State Water Aqueduct, State Water Project. This year, uh, in January, the governor declared a drought, and uh, Department of Water Resources actually decided that they would provide zero allocation for all the state water contractors. As you can tell, that put us in for quite a shock. Um, you know, water, we, down here in the Antelope Valley, we don't have a convenient, nice, large reservoir to pull water off of. We're very uh, dependent on getting the water from the aqueduct, so it was very scary. Uh, for us. That zero allocation is actually going to come up to 5%. We just heard over the weekend, but that's still a very low amount of water. And we're not getting to September, yeah. Um, we were actually, just like someone with uh, change in their hand, not much to spend, we were trying to calculate how much water we'd use over the year. What surprised us is over the winter, uh, these are historic highs that we've had, about 30% more than we've been used to because of the warm weather. And you may have noticed, you know, even yourselves, everything is starting to bloom early. People are starting to use water. Well, that was another uh, thing that we found was unexpected. There's a whole lot more water usage. And still, it shows January, February, March, we had the same until the rain. It was higher than normal usage, which is, we don't have any water from the aqueduct. It's got to take water from somewhere. So the next slide, I'll show you. So what, uh, what have we been doing for drought preparation? Um, to, you know, to get ready for all of this. Well, we've been doing groundwater banking out on the, uh, the west side in AVEX Water Bank. And the idea is if you have more water in a good wet year, more water than 
can be used. It can be stored uh, in the ground. Basically, you can see a picture there. It's dumped onto these big lake areas, percolates into the ground, and you can pump it back later when you need it. That's exactly what we're doing this year. The water that's put in the ground, we're pumping it back so that we can meet our, our everyday demands. The other uh, little pot of water that we have is carryover from 2013, and that's what they mean by carryover is in years past when AVEC has uh, ordered water from um, the State Water Project that they've had some water left in the reservoirs that weren't actually taken. We have about 8,800 acre feet from that that we're using. That's all part of the pot. Uh, we're boosting our well production um, all over town as much as we can. Um, we're starting to get uh, entrained air in places. I hope that if you're one of our customers, you don't get too much of that. But we're trying to boost wells water as much as we can. We're also going full force with our conservation programs. If you are our customers, you may have heard um, the reverse 911 calls to urge you to, to conserve water. You may have seen the billboard, or we have several billboards, but the, probably the one you may have seen is going north on the 14 near the animals or people to uh, sign, trying to say the drought is on. So that's uh, as far as looking forward to the future, uh, we do, we now have an under, um, a memorandum of understanding or agreement with AVEC to um, acquire additional water supply for new development. If new developer, if developers want to come here, and they want to um, go ahead and build a new track view project, there's a mechanism that they can go ahead and purchase uh, water, make a deposit, We'll work with AVEC. AVEC will go to try to uh, work a deal with other uh, water users to get more water. So that took, was a long time coming, and that's we look forward to that in the future to help us with our water supply. This is a pie chart of everything that um, that we're using right now. You can see a big part of it's the, the the blue area. That's what we're pumping out of the ground right now. The green and the Yellow areas, the carryover is the water I told you about in the reservoirs. Um, the banked water is with the water we have just on the west side. And the deficit, we're hoping that deficit uh, is uh, going to drop to nothing with, uh, with a little more water from the state and hopefully with demands. Now, what worries me about this whole chart is that the left side, the green and the, and the yellow are one-shot deals. I mean, once we use it, it's done until you get the next rainy year or a series of years that you can replenish that. That's the worry if we continue on for next year. Next year happens to be a dry year as well. And so we'd be just depending on the, on the blue. So it's not really a comfortable feeling that we have. So move to the next slide. So um, how can we meet that deficit if we, um, we end up? The thing is, you know, we can't necessarily predict what our demands are going to be at all times. It really largely depends on the temperatures and so forth. And just like the winter months, we were surprised how much more water people used than we thought they were going to. could happen any time in this year. But if we get into a problem where we can't make up that deficit, there are some options that we can do. There are some farmers, local and um, far distant, that we, there are a lot, they want to sell water, at least for this year. The problem is, and they will be able to get that water back in the aqueduct. The problem is, is that's uh, more than twice the normal cost. We end up paying about maybe $400 an acre foot. That's going to be $800, $900 an acre foot. Um, the other issue that what we're trying to do is we have a lot of our wells um, just naturally have naturally occurring arsenic in the water. It's just part of um, part of the geology up here that we have, and it's unfortunately it's very expensive and very intricate to treat that. But as condition, you know, conditions, drought conditions continue, or you continue to have water problems, that is something that we are seriously looking into doing: is providing some arsenic treatment. Um, but again, that will double, you know, the cost of water. We're hoping on a short term uh, and long term, but certainly we're hoping for quick results by uh, asking for voluntary conservation. I can talk a little more about that in the slides. Beyond, we were talking about recalling construction meters. Um, we're not considering that now. We're leaving the meters that are out there out there uh, at this point. Uh, we aren't allowing new construction meters at this point, mainly because we're worried about the about next year as well. And uh, if it got bad enough, we do have provi provisions that we can provide a mandatory conservation 
surcharge. And this is within our rules and regs. We don't want to have to go there, but it certainly is there. And, that, and if you go to the next slide, I think that will – a few slides from now, I guess it will talk about that. Uh, one of the things that the governor, when he declared California to be a drought, is he set up a drought relief fund. And he's asked for projects that we might be able to submit to help us get there. And um, as you can see, these projects below arsenic uh, treatment is a big issue. We can gain some more supplies if we're able to actually treat, do wellhead treatment at our, at our wells. Chromium-6 treatment is relatively new. You may have read about that in the newspapers. It just happened. I think it passed on the 15th of April of this month. It's, um, it's, a, it's a big deal for us because it's going to cost us a lot of money. A lot of our wells may not meet the new requirement, 10 parts per billion. Um, and so that's going to be a big chunk of money to be able to treat that water, to be able to provide some supplies. Recycled water project, those are um, – I know the city of Lancaster is very familiar with their end. We're also working with Palmdale for their side, for their trunk line. Uh, turf removal project, uh, currently we're providing a dollar an acre, a dollar a foot to be able to remove uh, your turf. This is, uh, we think this is a good project. This is a way to get people to you know, put in uh, zero scape or drought tolerant type landscaping instead of lawns. So that's money that would be well spent. Um, as I talked about with the water conservation, we are requesting 20% voluntary, and uh, it's um, you know trying to assist customers through conservation programs. We'll talk about that shortly. Promote awareness through public outreach. Um, here tonight to talk to your commission is one of the things we're doing, but there's many areas, and we'll talk about them in the next slide if you could go there. Uh, we're trying to you – know, we have billboards, as we mentioned before, um, on our on – our, Bills, we're calling people back to say, please conserve water. Um, giving people pledge cards, give them, a, you know, um, what can I do personally to save water? Uh, we're doing these at our outreach. Um, we're going to be there tomorrow, uh, next weekend at the Poppy Festival, any local festivals that we have. Flyers, we're going to schools. And uh, I don't know if, has anybody heard us on the radio? No, we've got a few out there, though. We're just starting. Somebody uh, today heard some, so we hope we get those out more and more. Um, if the situation gets worse, um, addition, potential additional measures that we could take, uh, requesting the board, I meant the board, that would be the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors to implement mandatory water conservation pricing. And there's different phases that we could go to depending on the severity of the drought, um, I think one through nine. Um, we were contemplating perhaps going to, um, I think it's phase three, where we charge everyone that uses 80% or less of the water won't be affected, but if you use more, then you get a surcharge on top of your additional, top of your additional usage. And at one point, and we're not considering this at this point, but recalling construction meters to reserve water supplies for, uh, for potable use. And right now, we're not considering recalling uh, existing construction meters. Um, we would, we do want to have people that are using. Um, construction water to try to go to recycled water as much as we can. That's a, something we are trying to push. It's, it's, a, it's an appropriate use for it, and it's the best use for it. So that's it. We tried to make it fairly short. Certainly open to hear any questions you might have. <laughs> questions might be longer than the presentation. <laughs> thank you, Mr. David. Appreciate sure. your your uh, presentation today, and, and certainly thank you for your, you all for providing the uh, information in advance of the meeting gave us an opportunity to review it. But um, at any rate, um, the members may certainly have some questions for you and, and for uh, the remainder or the other members of your team today. Uh, but we certainly appreciate you being here and sharing with us. Enjoy um, the opportunity. So if anyone, go right ahead, Ms. Scott. What is the process to treat arsenic water? Can you kind of go through that with us? Just in basically, we in, in investigating how to do arsenic treatment, we did visit some other facilities that were uh, somewhere nearby, some that weren't. But what it is, um, it the, the treatment process that, that I saw was two different ones. One used a um, like a powder, like a iron oxide type of system, big tanks where they pump the water through. Arsenic likes to stick with iron. 
So the idea is that you basically filter the water through these iron shavings, if you will. It's, I'm oversimplifying it, of course. But the idea, and then you, you flush that water out. You eventually get to a point where you have um, some waste that you have to take care of at the very end. But your water can be non-detect when you do this. It's just expensive to do. Um, the expensive part is setting up the facility, the maintenance of the, the water treatment or the water facilities, and also the disposal of the waste when you get, get it done. You've got a concentrated arsenic source. You've got to get rid of it somehow. There's also resin treatment, which is another way Coachella Valley is doing their uh, arsenic treatment. Just and so although it's expensive, after that treatment's completed, what's the purity of the water? What's it comparable to? It's no, well, as far as arsenic, it's focused right on arsenic, so it's non-detect after it's done through going through that process. In fact, it's designed that way to be non-detect. Or if you want to save some of your filter medium, you can blend it. You know, this, the um, maximum contaminant level is 10 parts per billion. You could you could um, take out you know say you had something that had 20 parts you could blend it down to um, something around 10 or say 12 and then blend it with other water that doesn't have arsenic so the result is below 10. There's lots of ways to do it. The more you filter, the more you use that that uh, medium, the more it's going to cost to replace it. So um, we're new to the field. We don't have any arsenic treatment um, facilities now. Um, one of the things that we've um, we've been interested in local local project is in situ uh, arsenic treatment, where water is pumped up to the surface, and U, um, U.S. Um, um, Geological Survey they did a study um, out on the west side near near the bank, where they they're the water bank that I was just talking about. They put water in the ground, and and the top part of the ground very effectively absorbs. I think because there is a lot of iron. In the, in the native soil, it actually pulls it out. So the water below um, can be non-detect. So that's, we like, you need space, you know, for situations like that. But that, we would prefer something along that line, if possible. But as far as speed and getting it going, the, the black, called black box treatment, you know, you, you put arsenic water in and out comes clean water and the other side is, is quicker. Not cheaper, but it's quicker to put in. Dan or, or Greg, you got anything to? Perhaps add to that. Okay. Just, just on the in situ, you know, the, even though the in situ is, uh, can be cheaper, there's kind of a, a limited life. Obviously, once you reach a certain saturation of the soil absorbing, it over time, you know, after 10, 20 years, that starts to decline off. So it's not a permanent fix. It, it's, it's not like you can remove the media like you can in a black box treatment. All right. <clears throat> Anyone else? Got some questions. Uh, question. um, on parts per billion, can you kind of give me a, a way of visualizing what a part per billion is? I, I just saw it in the newspaper the other day. It was 10 drops in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So uh, 10 parts per billion would be... Uh, 10 times 20, 100 drops in an Olympic-sized swimming pool of arsenic would be considered contaminated uh, with arsenic? Might have to go. 100, 100, 100, 100, yeah. Because 10, 10, if you put a dropper into an Olympic pool 10 times, you're over the limit. So barely a milliliter of arsenic per That's Olympic. Less, yeah. So how long have we been able to detect parts per billion? It's not hasn't been extremely long. Uh, yeah. Twenty years. They, they reduced years. the standard yeah. from fifty to ten, uh, about, about four, nine. What was that? About eight or nine years ago, wasn't it? About Before that. Yeah, years. about that. Um, they they being our state legislature. U.S. EPA. The EPA. Environmental EPA. Protection Agency. And also the California Department of Public Health also adopted the same standard. Um, moving on to. The chromium-6, that sounds like some sort of rocket fuel. Um, I hear it's naturally occurring. Yeah. Can you explain what chromium-6 is? It perforates the rocket fuel. Yeah. Uh, uh, chromium, it's, a, again, I, I'm not a geologist. I'm not familiar with the geological formation that generates the chromium-6. But the chromium-6 that we have in our service area is naturally occurring. Uh, if you remember, this was the Aaron Brockovich story uh, up in Hinckley, and that was a man-made source. Uh, unfortunately for us, we happen to be in a geological setting where chromium-6 just occurs as part of, of the geological processes here in the valley. 
Um, so it, it's, it's going to create a problem for us uh, to get into compliance with, with, that, uh, with that particular um, standard, but um, obviously, you know, we will. Yeah, we there's there's no national standard yet. It's still a goal, but CDPH April 15th set a 10 uh, parts per billion uh, M maximum contaminant level. How much was? 10. 10 part. Yeah. 10 is the magic MCLs, number. MCLs, but that's, those are, when, we, when you hear the word MCLs, those we have to abide by for operating permit for but our water. I've There's heard currently no Chrome 6 standard anywhere else in the United States except for California. Except because of that one lawsuit? Well, we don't know, but probably. I think it was because of one movie is what it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Arsenic is a uh, cumulative poison inside your body, so the more you take in it, the more you get. Is chromium similar to that, chromium-6? You know, I, I don't know. It's not uh, flushed out by... Yeah, I don't know about the uptake in the human body or, or how, that, how that takes place. Yeah, unfortunately, our water quality expert is none of the people here. On st yeah, we're, we're not the experts. I know it does break down to three, chromium-3. Three. Yeah, and that's part of the treatment process is to, to break it down into a more, uh, less, uh, toxic. Uh, less toxic version. So we don't really know what chromium six would do to the human body, or Us three I, I don't. don't know. But I think I think it's out there. They do. I think that information is out there. We're okay. Just, we we make sure that we abide by all the water quality standards, but we're not necessarily epidemiological experts and, or medical experts as far as what what actually happens. Yeah. Usually these these studies are focused on a certain vulnerable portion of the population, and then within that vulnerable po portion of the population, there's. <laughs> You know, one individual and you know a thousand or whatever they that they do would, studies. Yeah, and based on that, they come up with a you know well first goals and then maximum contaminant levels. And there's state. A lot of times, the fed the federal levels are less than the state. You know, the the state can't be less than the federal levels, but they can be more strict, which is often the case for California. Yeah, the federal levels are typically less stringent than California's uh, water quality standards. California leads the way. Um, on uh, banked water, has it raised the water table on the west side? The banked water. Yeah, um, I would I would say not appreciably. Uh, that program is one that we started uh, with AVIC probably what about three years ago, I think it was. So um, and there hasn't been that much water, quite frankly, uh, to be able to purchase yeah. and put in the ground ahead of time. Uh, so I'm sure there has been a change, but not an appreciable change. Does, yeah, uh, this drought hit us at a really vulnerable time. We're starting to get all the mechanisms in place to handle, you know, uh, good periods of having no water. And this is, we're just yeah. starting to get it going. It's like we got a new Ferrari, but we don't quite have the gasoline to, you know, run it very far. So so that's kind of how it is at this point. Um, we got 10,000 acre feet in, though. So it's, we're happy about that. One of my neighbors asked me to ask you guys. Uh, he says that he's very conservative with his water. He turns it off in the wintertime, lets his yard go brown, uh, very conservative with his water and his household use. When you decide to do your, um, how did you call it? Cash uh, for grass. No, no, the manager oh, man conservation. Yeah, the man will you measure his baseline off of what he's historically used, or would you measure it off of no. his neighbor's use? Yeah, it would be based on, I can answer the question. It would be based on a, um, a threshold that would be for his class of service. So he would it would not be him individually, it would be more of a threshold overall. So if he were on the low end of, of usage, he would be well within, most likely well within the 80% um, you know, reduct or usage, which would, you know, to get the 20% reduction. Um, you said we have enough water for development? Yeah, well, we, we have water f for uh, recorded maps that have recorded uh, prior to basically 2008. And then we're requiring new development to come in and purchase new water supply entitlement. Um, and that will secure their water supply for the, for the future for their, their projects. Have you given any consideration to the KB Homes uh, Home of the future out there. We took a tour of that recently, and they're doing an awful lot to really, uh, lower their water usages. Will they get any kind of break on that development cost for plugging in their meters, or is there any plans so, for you that? So the way that gets reflected, um, we track uh, overall usage within the districts. And uh, over time, we have seen that number begin to go down. 
Um, you know, as water supply planners, it makes us nervous when you talk about programs that it's very hard to institutionalize in perpetuity because it's our responsibility to make sure that the supply is there in perpetuity. If you have a homeowner and you have a home builder who happen to agree with what you intend to do with that property at the, at the beginning of it, you may get somebody in there later that has a different mindset. And it's very difficult to make sure that you're getting that long-term forever savings um, out of some of these, these programs. Um, but one thing we feel more comfortable with is looking at the long-term trending. You know, we have a 10-year rolling average of what that water usage looks like within the districts. And as that drops down, we feel confident that we can drop down what we consider to be the minimum amount of water to be used for a particular home. So I guess what I'm telling you, saying is there's going to be a lag time. There'll be a lag time between implementing these things and then we see that effect and then we can react knowing that we've got some confidence in, in what's going to happen in the future. So he's really on cutting edge, uh, Tom DePrima of KB Homes, so he's got a lot of work ahead of him. Well, that, that new I think water the answer was, was no. About. no yeah. yeah, I think that was your answer. Yeah, the, the new water Greg was talking about is very expensive. No, I, so I'm very familiar with yeah, that, Mr. Yes, I'm sure you are. <laughs> yes, I am. Actually, at any rate, um, I have go ahead. A couple more. Um, there's uh, farmers out here that are pulling out of our ground well water tables also, and I was wondering, farmers versus homeowners, what is the usage difference? Do they use a little more water than homeowners, or do they use less water? Yeah, I would I would say that um, now. Don't quote me on this, but um, you know, based on the stipulated judgment for the adjudication, the the um, you know, that's been set at 110,000 acre feet to pull out of the uh, uh, Valley groundwater basin. I would say, I would estimate that municipal pumpers are probably in the order of 30 to 40,000. Well, that, that kind of, they may use more overall. I think the question is an individual farmer compared to an individual homeowner. Oh, by far. But even overall, comparing all of the municipal pumping versus agricultural Correct. pumping. The agricultural, agricultural pumping, pumping is, place is far greater than the municipal pumping. So if the farmers reduce their pumping by 20% usage versus homeowners reducing it by 20%, we would have a far greater effect on water? It would. The, the, the only problem, though, is that uh, the facilities need to exist in order to be able to take advantage of that. So a farmer cutting back his pumping may make more groundwater available, but then I, as the municipal supplier, have to have the groundwater extraction capacity and the pipeline capacity to make use of that. So the, so your chart talking about 30,000 plus acre feet for your jurisdiction plus all of the other municipal and not, not municipal but uh, whatever they're called, I can't remember. Yeah, Things like and Westside and Park and, and all those, that, yeah. that's another 10,000 acre feet. So. Roughly, you have, you have 55, 60, 65,000 customers or so right. in, in your, so they're, they're using eight-tenths of an acre foot per, per customer somewhere in that range. Am I saying that about right? Yes. Yeah, approximately. Um, okay. You, were you just, what, you were taking the total demand? Or just the pumping? Well, no, you were talking about the groundwater, and I'm assuming from the from the supply chart you provided right. that ABEC is considered groundwater because it comes out it comes from somewhere. No, 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 no. That's the only the blue is what comes out of the ground. The rest of it is actually coming from. It actually originates from the state water project. Even the banked water originated from the state water project. Okay, I meant, thank well, you for the clarification. Okay. Thank yeah, you. you may have some more questions. I'm sorry. No. There. Um, so um, lately, we've been seeing um, news in the about the water uh, lawsuit that's been going on for the last what 20 years, 15 years, yeah. and it's supposedly coming to a conclusion. Do you have any? <laughs> does that mean that private wells will be metered? So the way the the end the end game. When this is all said and done, the judge has made his final decision. What ends up happening is uh, there is a specified amount of groundwater that can be pumped each year. Uh, and only those folks who are party to the lawsuits and acquired rights during the lawsuit had those rights sort of secured during that process. 
will have rights to pump that water. So there will be a water master that is created that is a, a body that makes sure that all of the provisions of the lawsuit are being followed. Part of that process will be if you pump, yes, you will have to report that usage to the water master. The water master will be responsible for making sure that you didn't over pump uh, or that you aren't pumping when you're not supposed to be pumping. So at the end of it all, there, there will be a, a mechanism to make sure that all the folks that have wells are living within their means uh, based on what the adjudication says is the limit. Charge you a fine if you overpump. Charge and fine if you overpump. That's how the other uh, typically that's that's the mechanism. Will they and look at a meter, or will they look at their electrical usage, or do you so? Have what'll, usually, what will happen um, is it'll be metered, and there'll be periodic periodic audits of those meters by the water master staff to go out and verify that the meter is accurate and that you read that meter accurately. And I, on a sort of annual basis, it's self-reporting. You have to report to the water master what your usage was. And then every two, maybe three years, they'll actually come out and verify that your meter is reading correctly and that what you reported is accurate. And if it's not, you face some pretty stiff penalties. The intent is to take that money then and replace that water. So one of the, one of the purposes of, of being fined then is you've overused. So in essence, you've damaged everybody else around you because you used more than you were supposed to. So now they've got to go out and replace that water. So they'll fine you and take that money and then go out and purchase water and put it back into the groundwater. Will the water master be an elected position or an appointed position? You know, those, that's those, those nitty-gritty details are all the things that are still going on in the adjudication. Well, no wonder it's taken so long. <laughs> right. What However, the explanations you offer are, as the principal litigators in the adjudication, right, the County of Los Angeles Waterworks District is one of the uh, principles that brought the suit. Uh, did that be uh, about right? Uh, we answered. Uh, we weren't the original initiators, but we certainly uh, got involved early on. But what you're presenting to us is, sounds a whole lot like um, what's been offered to the courts as a settlement. Well, I, what I described, down the other side of the hill, all those bases have been adjudicated, and that's how they work. In other parts of California, and too. In fact, and, yeah, and all up and down California. So we would assume one would assume from that that, that the right. courts would, be would find similar. a similar Yeah, we, we, we would think find, it would be something right. similar. At the end okay, of very good, thank 20, you. 25 years, and they end up with the same. <laughs> <laughs> I'm near the end here. You, go ahead. Um, lately, there's been a lot of talk of the Delta smelt, and a lot of people down here are kind of concerned about why our water is being diverted for a, um, a fish. And I've also talked to people that said that they've seen uh, water laid out in areas for migratory birds, and um, our dams are being torn out so we can have more water flow through the wild rivers and stuff. Is this kind of putting um, ecology or ecological management above what we need as um, consumers of water? Yeah, I think. You know, this is one of those questions, it, it really depends on your perspective. I think uh, the state is trying as best it can to balance some very uh, divergent competing interests. It's very difficult to manage your water supplies to ensure that you're getting enough water flowing south for people to consume, while also maintaining the ecological balance in, in the Bay Delta area. You know, the Bay Delta, you know, we talk about the Delta smelt. The Delta smelt doesn't have a whole lot of, of an um, economic value per se, but is an indicator species. And the environment in that ecosystem is uh, drives a lot of uh, economics when it comes to the fishing industry, for example. And if that gets out of whack too far, there's an economic impact on that side. So I think the state is trying very diligently to find that balance point. And I think in the past, the perspective at least has been that it's been too far on the side of providing water supply versus making sure you've got the environmental uh, um, side taken care of. I think at the end of the day, um, we will find a way to make that whole system work. Uh, the um, Bay Delta Conservation Plan that came out earlier, uh, I think that was late last year, um, with the suggestion of the twin tunnels, uh, that is something that I think there's still, there's still folks that are opposed to that as a concept, but I think at the end of the day, with a lot of legwork and a lot of education, uh, I think people will find that that solution will help 
kind of set that balance back to where it, 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 it should be. Um, it doesn't divert any additional water out of the system. All it does is firm up the commitments that have been made for that water already. So it's not as if another, one of the big fears is that we build these twin tunnels and more water is going to get diverted to the south and we're going to have worse ecological damage. The reality is they're sized specifically so that you can, we could only divert to the south what has already been promised to the south. The benefit is reliability. You'll be able to do that consistently without having to worry about what's the immediate impact today from our pumping operations on some of these ecological values. So I, I think in time we'll get there. I don't think we've gotten there yet, but I do think you know, we've got a plan in place, we've got a roadmap in place. Uh, I think it's really just going to be about education and people getting used to that concept and understanding what we're, what's, what's happening. So how much infrastructure that we had has been torn out to um, placate the environmentalists? You know, I'm not aware of any that's been demolished at this point. What has happened is a change in operations. Uh, one of the reasons I suspect, although I didn't read this specifically, that we're being told our 5% allocation has to wait until September 1st is because of the ecological uh, impact it would have if we took it during the summer months. Um, so I think that's why that September 1st, although, like I said, I didn't read that anywhere, but I surmise that that's why that September 1st timeline came into place. Uh, and certainly we have felt in the water industry the, the change in operations by the state and how they operate the state water project has created uh, a ripple effect to those of us downstream that depend on that water. Um, the ability to extract water when we need it has been reduced. Uh, it's created um, what some folks would, would argue is, is uh, a legislative or judicial drought uh, within the state. Uh, it certainly has created a, a level of complexity that was not there before, and it's taken time for us to sort of uh, readjust to that reality. So what I just heard you say here, let me get this right, is, is we don't really have a drought. We have people making rules that are causing a drought? Well, we have a drought today. It's an actual physical drought. There's no doubt about it. The rainfall patterns are off. We are well below the average. About four or five years ago, there was a, a decision in one of the California courts that changed the way the state operated the state water project. And at that point in time, we weren't in a, a drought per se in terms of rainfall. But because of the change in operations, it impacted the way water supply came to the south. And so a lot of people labeled it a judicial drought because it, it, it shrunk the amount of water that was coming to the south in particular times of the year. So it kind of got labeled as a judicial drought. Uh, the drought we're in today is, I mean, sure. saw the, the, the patterns that, you know, it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's a real, real no, yeah. no water falling from the sky type drought. It's unprecedented, really, this, at least last, state last water year, for example, project history, it hasn't been this dry. Yeah, last year, for example, was the driest year on record in terms of rainfall within the state of California. The record has been kept for what? Yeah, since the mid 1800s. 1800s. Yeah. If I could add, there is a, a place where the ecology does actually affect uh, us. And because the delta is an open system, it brings in water from the Sacramento River and from the San Joaquin River that collects basically all the watershed from the Sierra Nevada range and dumps it into the delta. When there's not enough flows, then the salinity levels from Sa San Francisco Bay intrude. And so what happens if you don't have enough flow maintaining that saltwater barrier out, then actually our water that gets passes through the delta becomes saltier and saltier to the point where if it's not, that barrier is not maintained, then we would also be affected because we, our, our water quality would dive down. That's part of the reason why uh, with the tunnels, they would like to be able to take high flows during rainy years, store it, and then during wet years, or excuse me, during dry years, they would be curtailed to the lower flow levels, whatever is needed to maintain the ecology in the delta. So it's, it, what it will do, like you said, is increase reliability. Overall volume over a 10-year period may be the same, but we'll be able to store more of it or take more of it when it's available and there's excess that's over and above what's needed for environmental purposes and thereby you know for drought periods have more water stored for for those uh, situations so what is the number of people that the state can support with its water are we got future plans for desalination plants or 
are we just only going to depend on what the snowpack puts in the Sierra Nevadas? Um, is 35, 40 million people about all the state can handle? Well, it, it really depends on if, if this is a long-term trend or if this is a temporary trend. If this is a long-term trend that we're seeing perpetuate for um, many, many years, then I think that we probably already exceeded the number that can be supported. And I think really uh, prices of water will drive us to desalinization. You know, San Diego is coming, is, is constructing, you know, in Carlsbad, the first plant. And they're... Their contract is for the water's about $2,000 an acre foot. Today we pay for wholesale water about $400 an acre foot here in the Antelope Valley. So you can see that we're still a long ways off to, to, to going that direction. Now San Diego, because they're in the line, they see the risk on the table. They feel like it's worth it for them to have this as part of their overall portfolio to mitigate risk. They've decided to bite that bullet er sooner than later and go ahead and build this, this treatment plant. But it took them 10 years to get the environmental approvals to do it, and they're just now, you know, con con construction now. And, and I, think that, I think that's kind of the long answer is that there are water supplies available. It really comes down to how much are we as a society willing to pay for that water. And, you know, if you look at, if you look at how much water flows through California, there is plenty enough water in California. It's getting the water from where it occurs to where it's being used. That's the problem. And it's, it's about building the infrastructure necessary to deliver those flows. Um, you know, the, the days of big water projects, I don't think really are behind us. I think we've got some more work that's going to have to be done in the not too distant future in terms of big water infrastructure uh, to make sure that the state's supplies Actually, that the state's demands are being met by the available supplies. Um, you know, we, city of uh, Lancaster, uh, has taken the lead in, in recycled water up here in the Antelope Valley. It's another component of a water supply portfolio that is vastly underutilized statewide, not just here in Southern California, but statewide. Uh, and when you talk about the quality of recycled water these days, of what's being produced by uh, sanitation districts statewide, most other places in the world would kill for water quality of that type. You know, for us, we get the ick factor of it's recycled water, it's been used before. Um, but at the end of the day, the quality of that water is very, very good. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, more than, than sufficient for uh, irrigation purposes, for example, which is a huge part of the water demand, especially here in Southern California. I, to just answer your question about how much would people pay for water, I think they would pay any price for water if it wasn't created by a judicial drought. If yeah, the, the lack of water was created by judicial drought. If there was actually a reason for it, other than just somebody's arbitrary, I'm going to say that the fish is really important type of thing. Anyway, I really appreciate your time, and I appreciate the commission's. Um... Back, Go ahead. back to the water wells at the water master. Is there a consideration for the farmer or the rancher, depending on what type of crop that they might be growing on that land? Some crops take more water than others. Um, is there some kind of a formula that's being looked at to accommodate that? No, I'm not familiar with all the intricacies of the adjudication per se, um, but in speaking of generalities, um, the way the process works is uh, the judge is presented with data regarding the amount of recharge that takes place in the groundwater basin. That recharge is rain that comes from the sky. It's also water that we import to serve our customers, it goes through their homes out to the sanitation district. The sanitation district polishes it, now it becomes effluent out of that treatment plant. That water also makes its way into the groundwater table eventually. So you have a, a couple of different places where you get inputs into the groundwater table the judge hears all that and comes up with a determination on, okay, how much can we take out then on an average in a year and not affect the health of the groundwater basin itself? And that becomes the safe yield. So that's the number that the water master is going to be shooting for year in and year out. Now what ends up happening typically in adjudication is you've got people who are pumping way more than that. That's why the adjudication begins. Somebody their well went dry, they were fine before, somebody moved in next door, they drilled the well, now they're not. So somebody begins the lawsuit because they got affected by the drop 
in groundwater levels. So typically what, it, what ha ends up happening is that number, that safe yield, is oftentimes half or a third of what the historic pumping has been. So how do you deal with that situation? What ends up happening is you, as a party to that lawsuit, have to come and improve what it was you had been producing year in and year out. What was your usage? How much did you use of that? That becomes sort of your, your proportionate piece of the pie. So if everybody's using three times as much water as they should to maintain that safe field, then everybody arguably should take a two-thirds cut. So it, it's, that's kind of, in general, how that all works out is, is you have to show out of the overall pumping that was being done, how much were you doing, and then there's a proportionate decrease thereafter. So there's, there's subtleties and there's changes and variations and deals that get struck in a negotiated settlement type setting, but in general, that's the concept of, of how these things get resolved. A lot of times there's a water market that's developed too. You know, say you've got a, a well that you're, or that you're not producing, you could produce, say you have 100 acre feet that you could produce, but you only produce 50. Someone over here overproduced 50. Maybe you could sell them or lease them that amount of water. Right. So there's and lots of different situations that could be set up under adjudication. And with a farmer, once this is all a done deal, they're going to have to then look at what they were doing before and determine how much of that they continue to do based on the reduction that they are now living with. Are they going to change their crops? Are they going to reduce the amount that they, they plant? Are they going to sell it off altogether? Um, you know, so there's, that's a decision point that each farmer is going to have to make uh, to determine, you know, whether or not they're going to continue their business. If their business plan continues, is still workable under the new uh, threshold. All right. Anyway, Mr. Traciano. I'd like to start with a very simple question. I, I know who AVAC is. Who is uh, the MOU? Oh, MOU is a memorandum, sorry. memorandum of understanding. So it's uh, uh, basically a contract between uh, the Waterworks Districts and ABEC. It's an agreement. Yeah. Sorry about that. I didn't spell that out. No, I appreciate you clearing that for me. Um, maps that are already in place uh, have water allocated for those projects. Um, it sounds like if somebody wanted to file a new map for a development, they would need to come to the district and basically broker a water deal for that project? Is so what, what that MOU does specifically, it's an agreement between us and AVEC that um, provides a mechanism for this developer to acquire new water that is needed to supply their development. So AVEC will collect a deposit of $10,000 for every acre foot that is needed to supply a particular development. They will then go out into the water market and purchase uh, what's called Table A water, which is um, Table A is, is the water that has been allocated within the state water project. So what they would have to do is find another state water project contractor in the system who's willing to sell and then purchase that supply and then allocate that supply through us to that development. Are these prices currently regulated or? No, it's, uh, it's open market. It's, That's an interesting question. Which is, actually, which is, actually, I think I should correct you, um, Mr. Lafferty. Sure. The Waterworks District collects the fee. We do collect the fee. We collect it, the fee. It, and it, AVAC is no part of that agreement. Well, they, they're they no, have, they they're not agreed. a signatory to it, and water. don't argue with me because I just went through one. They, they, they have agreed to do their best to get the water. Is actually, I, you know, maybe they have, maybe they haven't. Depends which director you talk to. Go ahead, Fabian. I, I thank you for your time, and I think that answers my questions. Okay. So let's talk about governance first. The Waterworks District is governed by an agency that currently sits as the Board of Supervisors, but as the governing agency of the Waterworks District, they are called something else, right? They are the Board, uh, board of Directors for the Waterworks District. Okay. So in our county, the rules related to your jurisdiction are the, are the five, have been known as the five kings, right? Yeah, the, the board itself 
is the one that, that adopts right. okay. changes so, the rules and regs for us. So the the the, uh, the customers you serve in this valley, roughly 55,000 plus, I don't know what the number is, you probably know. 56,000. 56,000? 56, 56, yeah, but AVEC also serves Acton, which is another uh, about 1,400, 1,500. But that's not the Waterworks District. That's 37, this is yeah. 40, right? Yes. So this commission and this city are concerned about 40. And that portion that you serve, plus the other waterworks districts that are within our city boundary. So, my, my concern, uh, I have multiple concerns. Um, as, an, as an advisory agency to the city council relative to the uh, development opportunities that are presented to us and, and within our jurisdiction to make decisions and recommendations to the City Council. Uh, if we're potentially facing, and, and you've stated, I think if I understand it correctly, you're, you're not withdrawing construction meters, you're just not issuing any. Would that be about right? Mm -hmm. Okay. However, it's within your authority or the, the Board's authority to adopt that regulation at any time to withdraw construction meters? That, that is actually already uh, a regulation within the water districts. It's already stated that way in but, our rules and regulations. So you could do it at any time? Correct. And you, could, fact, you could withhold service at any time to existing customers? On a construction meter, which is a temporary service, yes. But it's permanent service, you can't withhold service? I'm sorry, what? Permanent service? No. But you can restrict the amount, the volume? Uh, we can uh, create financial disincentives for you uh, to use more than what we think you ought to Kind of like Edison's done, raise the bill. Except you don't have to go to the Public Utilities Commission. You only have five people to get three votes to do it, right? Correct. Okay. Just want to be clear that I understand what we're, we're facing mm -hmm. because some of the decisions we make impact those customers and those expectations because our our growth and development in this community is we're either moving forward or we're moving back you can't stay stationary and I you know and I appreciate what you folks are saying regarding these opportunities that we're faced with here in this community and other communities within this valley um, that, that you're trying to work within the system to allow progress to continue and 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 really not throw a dark cloud over it, even though reality is what it is, usage is what it is. So how do you, how do you encourage people other, th other than through a, literally a hammer, to, to reduce the consumption of this precious commodity? Well, we try to be persuasive and show people that there is a vested interest on their part to use less water. Uh, and to, to try to be more sensitive to the environment in which they live uh, and, and create water demands on their own property that are more consistent with the environment that they're living in. So, um, so about two-thirds of your source is, is well water uh, uh, it's about pumped out of the wells. It's, it's uh, one -third well norm, in a normal in year, a normal we year. would bring, yeah, in a normal year, we bring in two-thirds of water imported from the State Water Project. This year, however, because of the, the low allocation, we are pumping the groundwater a lot more than we would in any normal year. So, so your well system, as, as vast as it is, are at different levels. They're tapping a different water table all over the valley, aren't they? They're not all 2,000-foot wells. I mean, they're mostly, what, four to 600-foot wells? Yeah, generally, yeah. No, they, they go down about 1,000 feet. Yeah, I mean... Typically, they're, they're a thousand feet or less. We're typically mostly tapping into the upper aquifer. We did have wells that tapped into the lower aquifer, uh, but we found that you know the arsenic levels down there are much higher. So uh, many of those older wells, we retrofitted them to only to uh, only tap the upper aquifer, mm -hmm. uh, and then new wells since that time, we've really constrained to the upper aquifer. 
So I guess the, the, the challenge, some of the challenges we're going to face is how we address without a, you know, without a, quote, moratorium or a um, condition of approval that, um, that limits the opportunity for development in our community because of the water service. I mean, we have standard requirements that the, that the uh, developer, you know, seek uh, a will serve. Um, however, we are, our uh, approvals aren't predicated on that. It's a condition of approval. So um, unless we decide to make a recommendation to the city council and they want to change the city ordinance, then that condition would stand. I mean, you recognize that. But the ability to secure a will serve letter, um, besides the normal fees and the no normal capitalization costs uh, to your district as or to the other water purveyors within our jurisdiction, there's an additional $10,000 per <coughs> acre foot or per unit, shall we say, um, that, that um, the user would have to enter into. So how do you guarantee, let me, let me ask this first, it's prudent to, to have reserves when you're budgeting. Um, can you tell me what the Waterworks District 40's reserve is? When it comes to the, the supply? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're not operating on a, on a net zero number, are you? So you're talking about financial reserves or you're talking about water supply? The, the water supply is source. I mean, you're not, <laughs> you have 55,000, 60,000 customers. You're not operating on a zero reserve. You have a reserve somewhere, don't you? I mean, we don't, we don't have any water stored anywhere except in the bank. No, I understand you don't have anything stored, but right. but how how do you how do you right. do business without a reserve? Yeah, well, well, basically, what we've been our planning has been based on two sources of supply. So we have first looked at what we think the adjudication will produce as far as groundwater limits for us. Then we also look at AVEX supply, and in a normal year, a normal year where they would get 58 to 60 percent of their entitlement, their table entitlement, we would assume that we would get a portion of that. We take those two numbers together, we put that together, we look at our existing historical demand, uh, the trends that are going on now, then we add the committed demand to that, and that we've basically determined at that point that we are at Zero. We are we are uh, the the committed demand plus the existing supply uh, equals the um, uh, excuse me the committed demand plus the existing demand equals the available supplies. Now the supplies given are not things that we have secured in a you know um, I mean you know obviously we've got fluctuations in state water project levels. Um, so these are long-term averages, and these are also what we would anticipate we would be able to get in any particular situ you know, long-term situation. So uh, within that, there's a lot of variability. And like I said, um, you know, in a year where there's very little supply, then we're reaching out to other mechanisms like uh, banking, like um, dry year programs and so forth to to make up that difference. Yeah, I think the short answer to you is we don't have water supply reserves in the way that you're thinking. Well, about. you have commitments. You, uh, if I understood you correctly, you have supply commitments. Uh, besides your uh, customers that are online that have meters, you have commitments to other folks who have, have or had uh, will serve letters. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So um, have you negotiated any uh, uh, downward trend in those uh, uh, supply uh, agreements for the committed demand commitments. Yeah, that you you previously had and and now they've been reduced. Either the development went away or you've negotiated uh, negotiated them down. So the way that works for us is we don't solicit a developer. Now, I, I guess you don't understand my question. Let me see if I can restate it. If if you had a uh, if you had a will serve a commitment for a thousand units and then withdrew it, you have the power to do that? No. 
Now, once the map's been recorded. Yeah. So, so I think to, to respond directly to your question, we don't have any will serve letters that have not expired uh, that uh, have not expired for unrecorded maps. So, what we're talking about the co that committed demand is for lots that have been created. Right. And at the time of approval of those lots, they were they whatever local commission you or, or otherwise um, made a made a determination that there was sufficient resources to, to supply water to that uh, to that lot. Right. We unless that map is now unrecorded or reverted back to acreage, we are maintaining that commitment to that recorded map. So the only way legally that that our council has seen that that water could be a, relief from that project would be to revert that project back to acreage, uncreate those lots, and then that water would be freed to be used on a first. So recently that hasn't happened in your district? It has not happened. Interesting. you care to comment on the, uh, on the public works director's uh, letter to the cities withdrawing the allocations that, that the city of Lancaster and the city of Palmdale had? The thousand units that uh, this city had, and the 400 the city of Palmdale had. Well, I, I thought the letter explained that program, both its intent of creation and why we were taking the step currently that we did take. So you did take them back. You've taken our reserve back. So those were never actually reserves. The that water, from the from the moment that pro that program began, there was at least from our perspective an understanding. <clears throat> that that water would have to be repaid at some point in time. So it wasn't as if there was a reserve or a pot that we were dipping into. Uh, we recognized that, that there was um, a need for projects to move forward. And so we created a process in the interim pending our negotiations with AVEC to come up with this means for securing long-term supplies to bridge that gap. That had always been intended, though, when that program came back into place, when we finally got that worked out with AVEC, that the cities would work with us to replace whatever water had been given out under that program. Now that that program was in place, we didn't see any reason to make loans out of that again. Rather, use the program. Because the intent was that that program would be used to replace whatever water had been given, rather than give out of that, just so how do you, how does the mechanics of that work? Because the the uh, um, water service purchase agreement, ten thousand dollar per unit, is only for new projects. So of the of the reserve, which I call it, maybe that's the wrong terminology, but those thousand units that some of which have been allocated, are, and that have now been withdrawn, in effect. Those projects are at risk unless uh, the developer or the city or the combination thereof is willing to uh, come up with the $10,000 per unit on top of all the other costs and fees and, that, and capitalization. That'd be about right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Just so we're clear, because the folks then who will follow you offering development opportunities. I'm sure they understand better than I do how the system's going to work. But we need to understand when, when these things come before us, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's, only, it's only record maps. It's only record maps that have the reserve, right? That's correct. Yeah, whether, they, the whether they be a track map, a parcel map, right. residential, commercial, industrial, right. if, they have, if they have a record map, the only way they were able to record that in this city was, was to have your commit yours, the water district's right. commitment to supply. Correct. Right? Right. So if that map hasn't reverted to acreage, they're home free. Well, that's a, probably a bad term. <laughs> there, there, is, there is water for their project. There's water for their project. And that's a commitment but not a reserve. Correct. So, for instance, Let's just say the, that you can't provide that commitment when, when that project comes online. What happens? Uh, there would be no reason why we would not be able to make that commitment. Well, if, if the 
the carryover didn't happen, or the, or the banking didn't happen, or the def deficit. I mean, so that number is based on the long-term reliability of the state water project. So when we talk about um, the amount of demand that we have, plus the amount of commitments that we have, the amount of water that we have from groundwater, and the amount of water that we would expect over the long term from the state water project will cover those. Okay. Yeah. And, and, your rule, here, and your and your ongoing rules and regulations give give the water district the authority not to withdraw service, but to reduce the volume, if you will, or, or acre foot, uh, acre feet of water to a project, and that would be done district wide on some formula yet to be established. So under the potentially rules, under the rules and regulations, we have the ability to determine what the the uh, threshold. Well, the per customer or, or per billing unit use. Whatever, is. whatever, whatever that is. Correct. And and that that's in place. You don't have to go back correct. to your directors to correct. discuss that. Correct. There's there's no authority beyond your own administrative authority to do that. We, we have that authority currently. Okay. But in order to initiate a particular level, we would need to go to the board to to initiate that. that You're talking water conservation. Right. He's talking about the water demand. If, if oh. demand goes down to 0.8 acre foot uh -huh. per lot, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Rather than 1.2 acre feet per lot. Yeah. So, I know there's been some discussion about the, you know, we all calculate it. I think a little differently. The uh, the majority of the users are residential properties, and and some calculations say it's less than seven tenths of an acre foot. Others say it's 1.2. Some say it's 9.5. What's the real number as far as the Waterworks District is concerned? Uh, well, we have been using 1.2, uh, but we have seen data uh, that suggests a better number is 1.0. It's what? 1.0. 1.0. And you have others that would claim that it's less than 8 tenths. Yeah, there are other people who would claim it was less than that. but. Uh, uh, from our perspective and the data that we're looking at, uh, 1.0 okay. is probably a better number than 1.2. Okay. So, um, I think we're concerned, one of the things we're concerned about is new construction and new development opportunities, whether they be commercial, industrial, or residential. Um, in the development process, the, the end result is the is the uh, setting of a meter and providing service to the ultimate user. But prior to that, there's a substantial amount of treated water that's used to develop the project. If I heard you correctly, that's that's a concern. I mean, it's a concern of mine. I think it's a concern of, of a lot of people taking that valuable treated water that costs 400 and some odd dollars per acre foot and use it for grading, use it for dust control and all those other things. And it's not just the development community. It's the public sector, your, your uh, division, all of public works, our public works sector. So when there's conversations about withdrawing construction meters, that affects us all. And and I would assume, and I, I don't know this, but maybe you can tell me, I would assume if that ever happens that everybody would be treated the same. Everybody that pulls water, treated water for construction purposes, would be treated the same. Is that the way you all see it? Yeah, that, that's actually happened in the past. Yeah, I, I'm aware it has, yeah. yeah. So and the idea is we did pull, you know, we said, okay, no more construction usage. and. Uh, they're typically short periods of time. It wasn't the same situation exactly we have now, but it's been done from time to time. We do try to be as fair. I recall uh, siphoning siphoning water out of the aqueduct in, yeah. into tanks, and yeah. not a lot of fun. It's, it's and, not and something we we like to do. It's just a it's a last uh, resort measure. But um, if your tanks are going dry, and and you're especially back in the day when you had maybe no doubt, eight no to doubt. seven million gallons a day coming but out. But I just want to be sure that that the entire quote development community, not just the folks for profit, the 
the public works people, uh, the folks that go out and, and grade the swales and, and spray water all over them uh, to keep the dust down. Um, all of those folks are all going to be treated the same if and when that ever happened. I mean, that's, that's what I want to be uh, assured, that we're all going to be in the same boat together. We're not just going to, well, we're not going to, we're going to accept or exclude um, certain segments of, of... Well, if there were exclusions, it was the cities, maybe the road, but both of the people that had in unsecured meters you know, maybe for street sweeping or for sewage and so forth, public health type of, of issues that we have excluded. Well, I think the, the answer to your question is it would depend on the severity. The rules would be applied equally. What the rule is would depend upon the severity of the situation we were confronting. So if it was a situation as what we were saying uh, as of four weeks ago, uh, where we decided we weren't going to issue any more construction meters, but we allowed those people that had them to maintain them. Had the situation been more dire, we would have pulled those meters from even the people who are already using them. So moving forward, whatever the situation is going to be that we would be addressing, the, the rule would be applied uniformly. And that's only in 40? What uh, works this report? 37. Acting as well. And 37. So I have a... Um, on a personal note, I have a school project that breaks ground in a week with about um, two months worth of mass grading. So what you're telling me is we're not going to get a construction a construction meter? You know, because the state just this week, and literally it was Friday, at Friday morning, uh, granted us the 5% allocation, um, we may take another look at the construction meter policy. Uh, we have not today uh, done that. Um, but we may take another look at that and, and, and make a change to it. Now, what that change may be, we, we had some discussions uh, about, you know, if you had intended to haul water from the start, then maybe we say you continue to haul water, but it's recycled water. Uh, otherwise, it's business as usual for most folks. Now, we, again, we haven't had the discussion internally uh, and made that decision formally. Um, but the, the fact that we got a 5% allocation, while it's not a lot of water, it's enough that it makes a difference to us uh, mm. in this particular setting. It'll make quite a difference to a public school district, that's for sure. I'm sure it would. Well, um, make sure I've got all mine. Okay. There may be some more. Anyone else have any questions? Comments? All right. How about staff? Any of any of our staff have any questions or comments they'd like to make? No? All right. Again, thank you so much for, for sharing their, your time and the information today. Um, very informative, and we're very appreciative of the fact that you've, you folks were able to come today and, and present. I'm assuming you're going to be presenting to other agencies, City of yeah, Palmdale, I'll tell you, probably. When we originally set this up, it was in light of the zero allocation, and worse than that, the carryover water that Craig had talked about, the state initially had been saying they were going to zero that out as well. This was going to be preparatory to us taking mandatory water conservation pricing as an action, which is why we started, hey, we got to get the word out, let mm -hmm. people know this is coming. Fortunately, the situation's improved. We are still uh, on the calendar, I believe, in May to speak to the city council, uh, basically give you just a slightly revised, give them a slightly revised version of what you mm -hmm. saw. Uh, similarly, we'll be reaching out to the city of Palmdale as well uh, with the same basic information. Well, we're, all, we're all in the same service area, that's for sure. We are. Well, we're, again, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we have any public comments. Well, we will have some public comments. So if, if you don't mind waiting a few moments. All right. Well, thank Again, you for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. The opportunity as well. <clears throat> we have one speaker card. Yes. Maria Paisano. All right. Thank you. Ms. Paisano, and welcome. Um, I know I only have three minutes here, so. Um, my concern here, when I came, why I came here today, um, when I saw that they were going to speak on the issues, the water issues and the drought issues. Um, I don't feel that there is really drought issues. Um, it's, the, it's the way that 
the water is being used and what it's being used for. Um, I know that um, this has happened over and over again. In 1966, um, here they had the, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, pin stripe, was what it was called, where they dropped, they dropped some um, uh, chemicals or whatever in uh, bombs in, in some of the wells, which contaminated the whole area out here. A lot of the farmers and stuff had to leave because they said there was no water. Um, and um, um, everything pretty much dried up around here. It was... Um, you know, a lot of the trees and everything, I mean, it was a bad situation, and they had to, they were supposed to have cleaned that up and brought it back, brought everything back at that time. Um, well, it went on like another 20 years, I guess, but um, what ended up happening then was the money was not put into those particular um, um, projects. I guess you could say, I mean, if they were for a while, I guess things kind of came back. But now what we have is the same thing pretty much happening over where, um, for one, the Topco, the Topco um, uh, company, which all, all this is to get to resources, to get to either, either it's for, um, um, I'm sorry, um, either, either it's to get to certain resources, to use resources, or, um, or that's being used for um, things such as uh, um, this happens every time I come up here and I don't know why like I said I'm, I'm concerned with the way what's the way things are being used, like I said, with Topco, we have petrochemicals, gas processing, um, reservoir engineering, drilling and well, and the water that's being used for even fracking or for the chemical processes is what's causing a lot of this water to be gone. Um, for instance, on 395 out there, um, all that water was drained so that they could get to um, some of the minerals and the, the resources that were there, um, which pretty much killed everything in that area. Um, it's what we see here, too, around this area now. Um, Thank you for your comments, Mr. President. Um, I know your time has expired. See, I know. See, this is what happens every time because I know I only have Thank so you. many minutes and I'm trying to, like, Your time has expired. Please take your seat, ma'am. Ma'am, please take your seat. Thank you. All right, do we have any other speakers? There are no additional cards. All right, thank you. At the beginning of the meeting, I should have pointed out that uh, Mr. Lukey and, and, uh, is on another assignment today. And thank you for, for being here, sir. Thank you. And Ms. Corbett, no lawsuits to file today? Great. Thank you. Not that we're ever involved in any, right? Um... Do we have any director's announcements? None at this time. All right, thank you. For the commission's agenda, anything from anyone? I would point out that um, I did attend uh, um, the S Power groundbreaking on April 10th, uh, the summer solar facility that we recently approved, well, recently a couple years ago. Um, for a 17 megawatt uh, solar photovoltaic project out on the west side, out 93rd and G, I believe it was. So, anyway, um, it, it was uh, quite interesting that particular project. You know, we've had some concerns about masquerading and scraping the ground and all the dust problems and so forth, and they've they've actually 
they're actually doing a much better job and limited grading and keeping the vegetation under control. Ms. Swain's been on them like a blanket, right? They've done a very good job with your with your oversight, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Neal. I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge your presence here today, but thank you for being here today and undoubtedly arranging uh, the Waterworks District coming to visit with us today, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. If there's nothing further, all right. We stand. Or well. Public business from the floor and non-agendized items. Do we have any of those? No. Okay. So we stand adjourned till a special meeting for agenda review on Monday, May 12, 2014, at 5:30 p.m. in the planning conference room here at City Hall. Thank you. <laughs>